das Licht ist heute besonders. Ich sehe Sie kaum. Aber Sie hören mich, dann ist es gut. Dann, dann geht alles seinen gewohnten Gang. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde der Körperstiftung und des Körperforums, herzlich willkommen hier zu einer weiteren Veranstaltung im Rahmen unseres Schwerpunkts Neuer Osten, Neue Mächte, den Aufstieg Asiens als Chance begreifen. In diesem Jahr stehen die Demokratien in Asien im Mittelpunkt unserer Aufmerksamkeit und nicht nur hier im Körperforum, wo wir bereits mit Veranstaltungen zur Zukunft der Demokratie in Indien und zum Thema Islam und Demokratie in Indonesien einen Beitrag unseres, zu unserem Schwerpunkt geleistet haben. Wir setzen unser Engagement auch in der Region fort. Im kommenden Monat werden wir zum ersten Mal mit unserem Bergedorfer Gesprächskreis, dem ältesten und sicherlich einem der renommierten Projekte unserer Stiftung, in Indonesien zu Gast sein. In Jakarta werden wir mit außen- und sicherheitspolitischen Entscheidungsträgern und Experten aus Europa, den USA und Asien über das Thema Sicherheit und Frieden in der asiatisch-pazifischen Region diskutieren wollen. Am heutigen Abend wollen wir das Thema Frieden und Sicherheit auch hier in unserem Körperforum aufgreifen. Wir werden die maritimen Konflikte in Ostasien aus südkoreanischer Perspektive näher beleuchten. Die Streitigkeiten in der Region sind historisch bedingt, wie wir gelernt haben, und emotional sicherlich hoch aufgeladen. Es geht um Inseln und Felsen, Festlandsockel und Fischgründe, aber eben auch um Gerechtigkeit, um Stolz und um Nationalismus. Dies macht eine Lösung der Konflikte offenbar besonders schwierig. Wir wollen heute Abend unter anderem fragen, welche Rolle Südkorea in den maritimen Konflikten Ostasien spielt und welche Regelungen im Rahmen des internationalen Rechts zur Beilegung der Streitigkeiten beitragen können. Ich freue mich, zu diesem wirklich spannenden Thema zwei ausgewiesene Experten und zudem einer als Wahlhamburger und der andere als Hamburger, dass ich beide so heute begrüßen kann. Professor Jin Huin Paik ist seit 2009 Richter am Internationalen Seegerichtshof in Hamburg. Nach einem Bachelor of Laws an der Seoul National University machte er seinen Master of Laws an der Columbia University in New York. Sein Doktortitel wurde ihm 1989 von der University of Cambridge verliehen. Er war unter anderem Gastprofessor an der Johns Hopkins University und Visiting Fellow in Stanford. Von 2010 bis 2012 war er Dekan der Graduate School of International Studies der Seoul National University. Bis heute ist er Präsident des Hesong Institute for Ethics in International Affairs und Vorsitzender der Sea Lanes of Communication Study Group Korea. Damit will ich mal seinen Werdegang hier beenden. Professor Paik, sehr herzlich willkommen bei uns hier in der Körperstiftung. Zudem ist es mir eine große Freude, Ihnen den Moderator der heutigen Veranstaltung, Herrn Professor Patrick Kölner vom Hamburger Giga-Institut, vorstellen zu dürfen. Professor Kölner ist seit Juli 2011 Direktor des Giga-Instituts für Asienstudien. Der studierte Verwaltungswissenschaftler promovierte an der Humboldt-Universität zu Berlin im Bereich Politikwissenschaft und habilitierte 2005 an der Universität Trier. Von 96 bis 2007 war Professor Kölner als wissenschaftlicher Referent am Giga-Institut für Asienstudien unter anderem für das Thema Politik und Wirtschaft auf der koreanischen Halbinsel zuständig. Von 2010 bis 2011 war er als akademischer Direktor an der Hamburg International Graduate School for the Study of Regional Powers tätig. 
Zu seinen aktuellen Forschungsschwerpunkten gehört unter anderem die institutionelle Entwicklung außen- und sicherheitspolitischer Thinktanks in Japan und Südkorea. Meine Damen und Herren, freuen Sie sich jetzt mit mir auf eine sicherlich sehr spannende Diskussion. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Um, it's also a real pleasure to be uh, on the uh, podium with Professor Peck, uh, who, uh, before becoming a judge here at the uh, International Tribunal for the, uh, uh, sea of the, for the Law of the Sea, uh, has already had an illustrious career uh, as a uh, scholar in South Korea, one of East Asia's most renowned specialists uh, on international law and the saw, uh, law of the sea in, in particular. Uh, so it's a great pleasure uh, to, to have him here. Um, and um, may I also congratulate the uh, Kerber Foundation for choosing what I think is a rather uh, topical um, and also sort of multidimensional uh, theme, uh, maritime conflicts in uh, East Asia. Um, it's uh, it's uh, certainly uh, a rather topical uh, one. Because, as many of you might know, the uh, intensity of such maritime conflicts uh, in East Asia has greatly intensified uh, in recent uh, years. Just to uh, sort of mention a few episodes that you might have uh, been uh, aware of, in 2010, uh, Japan and, and China were embroiled uh, in a dispute about the Senkaku Islands or the Aotai, um, which uh, led to, even to sort of mass protests in, in China and even uh, sort of a ban of uh, rare earth uh, ores to, to, to Japan. 2012, uh, the uh, same dispute uh, flared up again. Uh, and there have also been uh, many other uh, recent uh, incidents, not only in that part of the Pacific, uh, but also um, further south in the East China Sea, in the uh, Ch uh, South China Sea. Um, so uh, it is indeed a rather uh, a topical uh, issue we are addressing here. It's also a multidimensional uh, one, uh, because uh, there are many issues at stake uh, in these uh, maritime conflicts in East Asia. Uh, it's about uh, territorial integrity. Uh, it's about national security. Energy security is, is another issue uh, that looms large. Environmental sustainability, uh, regional st uh, stability, and, of course, uh, peaceful de development. And last but not least, uh, the role and the rule of law uh, and other codes of conduct uh, to, to, for dealing with these uh, issues. Uh, and of course, and maybe not surprisingly, uh, there are various national uh, perspectives uh, that uh, vary uh, quite a bit. Uh, there are different threat perceptions uh, involved in, in all this. Now we could say this is all far away. Why should we be so uh, really concerned about that here in Germany or in, in Europe uh, in, in general? Uh, but I would suggest that the uh, EU has an intrinsic uh, interest, or should have an intrinsic uh, interest, in the peace and stability um, of the region. After all, sort of 25% uh, of our trade, that is the EU's trade, uh, are with uh, um, um, East Asia. Uh, and uh, the larger, if you will, Indo-Pacific uh, is the world's busiest uh, trade and energy uh, highway. Uh, but might well turn into a zone of uh, serious, uh, serious um, naval uh, competition in, in the future. Uh, so, a topical and multidimensional uh, issue we are addressing uh, tonight. Uh, but I think before we really go into the, the subject, um, uh, we should talk a bit about at least uh, the, uh, uh, the International Tribunal um, for the Law of the Sea. Uh, this being a Hamburg-based institution, so I, I guess uh, uh, we could sort of benefit from maybe you're explaining a bit about the uh, role and, and functions of the tribunal, maybe also sort of giving some kind of maybe recent illustration of uh, what the uh, tribunal is doing. Professor Peck. Th thank you very much, Professor Quellner. Uh, before answering your question, let me uh, uh, thank Quiber Foundation for inviting me to this uh, evening uh, occasion, and I'm really delighted to be here to uh, share uh, some of my uh, knowledge or experience with you. 
Uh, one more thing I want to say is uh, um, I'm here in my, strictly in my personal capacity. <laughs> As you introduced, uh, I, am, uh, I have two hats. Uh, uh, I'm a professor, but uh, at the same time, I'm judge at the International Tribunal for the Law of CA. As a judge, I really should not uh, comment on the substance of any existing or potential uh, disputes. Uh, so please understand me when I try to evade the certain questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how successful I will be, but uh, uh, that's a kind of caveat I want to start with. Uh, uh, on your question, uh, 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 tribunal uh, is uh, 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 created by United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, which entered into force in 1994. This is a really comprehensive convention dealing with every aspect of ocean. Many people call this convention as a, a constitution for world ocean. Uh, we were created uh, by this uh, convention to deal with uh, maritime dispute, the law of sea dispute. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we are located here in Hamburg. Uh, so I'm sure many of you are a hamburger, uh, not in the sense of McDonald's or this thing, but <laughs> resident here, here in hamburger, Hamburg. Hamburg uh, and uh, uh, so you should be proud that you have very important institution in the city of uh, uh, Hamburg. Uh, uh, we have uh, 21 judges at tribunal, and uh, as I said, uh, we deal with uh, law of sea dispute. Uh, uh, we deal with uh, all dispute uh, related to interpretation or application of the convention, UN Convention on the Law of Sea. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, for maritime dispute, uh, this is a really premier uh, international uh, judicial body. We deal with uh, mainly dispute between states, interstate dispute. Uh, uh, since uh, we are relatively young uh, court, uh, we were created in 1997, so it's been about uh, 16 years. Uh, uh, so far, we didn't deal with the many cases, but over the past few years, we start to have more and more cases. Uh, so I'm sure uh, in the future, we will be established as a, a premier uh, judicial uh, body to deal with uh, any dispute related to ocean. Right. Could, could you maybe sort of mention one of uh, the uh, recent cases that you were involved in? Uh, sure. Um, um, I can, uh, we, we deal with uh, really diverse subject matter. We deal with uh, maritime boundary limitation, arrest of ship, uh, uh, protection of maritime environment, marine environment, uh, fishery dispute, uh, any dispute related to ocean. Uh, if I give you one or two cases which I dealt with uh, over the past few years, uh, one case is, uh, uh, maritime boundary delimitation between uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this is a, a, a huge area. This area includes uh, territorial CEZ and continental shelf. We delimit the boundary between these two countries. As you may know, the, uh, both Myanmar and Bangladesh are two of the world's poorest country, but they have uh, abundant resources in Bay of Bengal. But because of this dispute, they were unable to develop the resources uh, in Bay of Bengal, which is uh, critical to their national development. Uh, in fact, they have been in dispute over the last uh, uh, more than 30 years, I think 36 years and so on. They tried to resolve this dispute and in fact had uh, uh, more than 10 rounds of uh, negotiation, but they failed. They eventually submitted this dispute to us, and we were able to delimit the boundary only after two years of uh, uh, dealing with this case. And uh, both parties were pleased with the result, and uh, they, of course, accepted this uh, result, and uh, they were pleased with the result. Uh, 
and they are now ready to go for uh, development of these offshore resources there. So that was one example of how International uh, Tribunal for the Law of Sea can do uh, with respect to intractable dispute, which has which has plagued uh, both countries for more than 30 years. Uh, another case I can introduce to you is, uh, you may, some of you may have uh, read this in newspaper or media. Uh, there was a case related to detention of, of Argentinian worship, uh, Libertad, in the port of uh, Ghana. Uh, there is a long, complicated background uh, of this case, but uh, uh, I can't go into detail. But uh, anyway, uh, last November, uh, last December, we were able to release this vessel, uh, which was detained uh, in in Ghana, and uh, uh, there was again major breakthrough to the dispute between two countries. And uh, recently, both countries were. After our decision, both countries were able to amicably resolve uh, dispute arising of detention of uh, Libertad. So those are two cases uh, uh, I can uh, briefly introduce to you. Right. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last word uh, for the moment about the International Tribunal, about the judges. Uh, how many are there and how do they uh, get uh, selected? Are they actually, and maybe an add-on question, are they actually sort of representatives of their, uh, the, the countries they hail from? Are they representatives of the uh, governments they represent or are they there in their, in their personal capacity? Uh, we have 21 judges uh, from 21 uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, we don't represent the government. We serve a tribunal in our uh, uh, personal capacity. We are strictly independent, impartial. Uh, uh, so we, we do not represent the government. Uh, uh, sometimes I was asked this question very, very frequently. How on earth uh, 21 judges can reach, an, uh, can reach a judgment? Uh, but we do. <laughs> It, is, it may not be easy to believe this, but uh, often we r arrive at the conclusion rather easily uh, by overwhelming majority, like 19 to 2, or even last year when we dealt with this uh, detention of uh, Libertad, Argentinian worship, uh, we gave a unanimous decisions. So um, 21 judges may be a little bit... Uh, large number, but uh, we have been so far very effective uh, in dealing with this case. And how do the uh, judges get yes, selected? Yes, uh, judges, ele uh, elect, uh, judges uh, elect, go through election uh, by state parties. We have 166 uh, state parties to UN Convention on the Law of Sea. So this 166 country get together at the United Nations to elect uh, uh, judges uh, every three years. Every three years, one-third of judges, that is to say seven judges are uh, elected uh, at state parties meeting. Uh, so th th this is basically election. Uh, you do uh, uh, have to have some kind of campaign to get elected. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, with the support of uh, your your country, uh, uh, government of country you come from. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, uh, election. Once you get elected, however, you have to work uh, in strictly uh, uh, independent uh, capacity. Right. Thank you. Uh, well, then we should get into the topic of uh, maritime uh, conflicts in East Asia uh, proper. Um, and I guess one way of sort of uh, getting into the topic is to, um, well, go for some kind of conceptual definition, I guess. Um, and that is sort of, what do we actually mean uh, when we talk about maritime conflicts uh, in East Asia? Is it just about sort of the territorial uh, dimension, about sort of uh, territorial disputes and diverging claims? Or is, is there more uh, to it? Um. 
Actually, I don't know. This uh, puppy was given by <laughs> Kerber, Kerber Foundation. Uh, conflict is, uh, to me, a little bit strong expression. But anyway, um, when we say uh, maritime conflicts in East Asia, I understand by this term that uh, maybe any disputes uh, or conflicts uh, related to uh, sea or ocean but uh, uh, obviously, over the past uh, few years, uh, uh, when you say maritime conflicts uh, in East Asia, we usually talk about uh, uh, dispute over island uh, and uh, also dispute over um, um, maritime boundary related to island uh, and so on. So most prominent, uh, mo most uh, conspicuous aspect of this uh, conflict may be uh, territorial or boundary uh, conflict among states. But the maritime uh, conflicts uh, in general can encompass uh, many, many uh, diverse uh, conflicts or disputes. Right. And what would you say have been sort of the sort of most salient um, maritime conflicts in East Asia in, 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 in recent years? At present, uh, I, at present, I think the most uh, salient uh, maritime conflicts in East Asia may be uh, South China Sea dispute and uh, East China Sea dispute. When I say South China Sea dispute, it is really dispute over uh, many small um, islands or rocks located in South China. Uh, and also, as a result of this dispute over islands or rocks or islets, uh, you also have a uh, uh, dispute over um, uh, this maritime boundary uh, and, and so on. So I think the most uh, salient uh, conflict uh, uh, in East Asia, uh, at the moment, is a dispute over uh, South China Sea, and to some extent, dispute over uh, East China Sea. We also have a uh, uh, dispute over uh, small islands in East Asia. Uh, so, uh, East China Sea dispute and South China Sea disputes may be the most kind of uh, hot. Uh, uh, dispute uh, at, at, at the moment. All right. I, I noticed that you sort of distinguish carefully between sort of islands, islets, and rocks. Is, is there a difference uh, from sort of lawyer's point of view between these uh, uh, different terms? Um, island is defined uh, uh, under uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea Island. It, is defined it as uh, this uh, uh, land which is above the water at the high tide. So this land must be above water all the time. There is uh, some uh, land which is above the water at low tide, but under the water at high tide. That is what you call uh, low tide elevation. Uh, so obviously, island is different from low tide elevation. Even among this island, which is uh, uh, at above the above the sea, above the surface of sea, all the time, uh, Law of Sea Convention make distinction between island and rock. This is a small rock which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of its own, cannot enjoy uh, this so-called EEZ or continental shelf. They can only have uh, uh, territorial sea up to 12 miles, but they cannot have uh, these huge zones uh, such as 200 mile EEZ uh, or continental shelf, which is even broader than 200 miles in some cases. Uh, so depending on uh, whether this is uh, uh, small rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or uh, more sizable island which can sustain such human habitation or economic life of its own, uh, 
the the there is a huge difference. Uh, if the former cannot have a, a maritime zone other than territorial sea, up to 12 miles, so narrow belt of uh, sea. On the other hand, and the latter can have uh, not only territorial sea, but also huge zones uh, such as EZ or container shelf. So there is, a, there is a big difference. Right. So having an island or a rock really makes a difference in terms of sort of the uh, zone that you can uh, claim that you can mm -hmm. use then exclusively in economic terms, uh, 12 miles uh, for a rock and 200 miles mm -hmm. uh, for an island. Um, well, but if these, these islands and rocks, I mean, most of them are inhabited, uninhabited, um, why are they so, so precious uh, to the government's concerns? Why is there so much dispute about these islands if they are pretty barren after all? Well, in... In South China Sea, uh, as far as I know, there are more than uh, 200 uh, uh, this, uh, this land formation, I may use this term, land formation, which can include the islands, rocks, islands, low tide elevation, and so on. Uh, you really have to look at uh, whether this land formation can be qualified as island or rock or anything. But anyway, um, why this is important? Uh, maybe f first, uh, depending on whether this is qualified as island, uh, uh, this maritime feature, this land formation can, as I said, can enjoy huge maritime zones. Uh, It's a small island can have a really huge uh, maritime zone. So there may be one reason. Uh, another reason is any uh, uh, any territorial uh, sovereignty has uh, some kind of symbolic meaning, no matter how r their real value may be. So no country uh, would just disregard the... Uh, Uh, sovereignty over these tiny islands or islets uh, or rocks uh, uh, because uh, they are not very valuable in terms of uh, uh, you know economic value or strategic value uh, so then maybe the second is and this is symbolic or uh, uh, value of uh, sovereignty I don't know, third, maybe some strategic value in terms of their location, if uh, it is uh, located in strategic uh, uh, place, uh, then uh, although this may not have a lot of economic value, you may say that a certain island may have some strategic value. If it is located in, the, say, uh, uh, important international sea lanes for navigation, then uh, uh, such uh, small uh, islands or rocks can have certain strategic values. And I think those are the uh, values or reason why the states uh, are really uh, eager to uh, make claims to those, those uh, islands. Right, so, so in a way, possession of these islands and rocks and, and, and so on uh, then also gives you um, or entitles you uh, to um, um, developing resources uh, in that area, including sort of fishery resources, uh, natural resources, mm -hmm. that is oil and, and, and gas and maybe other forms of, of energy resources as well. Um, then identity politics, you mentioned, play, play an issue. In some cases, uh, even uh, strategic factors, though one, I'm not quite sure about that, because if one looks at some of these uh, uh, islands, really, I mean, sort of which have the size of a, or less than, than a soccer pitch, mm -hmm. uh, really, sort of what, what the strategic uh, value might, might be there, but um, uh, it could be, I guess, in, in some, uh, if they are sort of located in sea, some sea lanes of communication, uh, they might play a role, you think, mm -hmm. in some uh, co uh, sort of considerations of a, of a more strategic or purely military uh, uh, nature? Well, Saka field is, uh, in fact, a big island. Uh, 
there is a small rock, rock uh, size of uh, queen size bed, not king size bed, queen size bed. I emphasize it, <laughs> but it's still, uh, well, some countries claim huge, huge maritime area around uh, this uh, queen size bed rock. Uh, you know, if you can calculate, uh, just uh, just imagine how big maritime zone they 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 can claim. Queen size bed rock, and then you have 200 nautical mile EZ. Uh, 200 nautical mile is uh, 383 kilometer. Then you can have continental shelf, which is even broader than that. Uh, so we are talking about a really huge area. <laughs> this small rock can, uh, is entitled to huge maritime zone. You may have uh, oil and gas in the bottom of uh, that maritime zone. You may have uh, fishes. Uh, you may have uh, uh, wind energy, wave, wave energy, tidal energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so some of the um, conflicts surrounding uh, these these islands and rocks. I mean, uh, they have been going on for for decades, and in, in, in some cases, and, and might have even a, a longer history. Uh, some of the claims there. Why is it then that uh, only in more recent times uh, conflicts have uh, atten uh, intensified? What what is behind this intensification of, of conflicts? Is, is it all about? Is it just a reflection of you know geopolitical rivalry? Uh, ultimately involving the U.S. and, and, and China? Uh, what are the factors uh, behind the intensification? What do you think? That, that's a good question. Um, I, I think I can think of uh, um, um, maybe three or four uh, reasons for recent uh, really, really surge of this uh, maritime dispute in East Asia. Number one is... Uh, um, I, I think it has something to do with uh, this uh, uh, um, change in uh, really kind of structural change in international relations such as uh, end of Cold War and rise of China. Uh, during Cold War period, uh, many states behaved rather cautiously. Uh, you know, during Cold War period, the world was divided into two blocks. Uh, Asian region is also divide, was divided into two blocks. Uh, and then uh, uh, states belonging to one block uh, and the states belonging to another block, they, there was a high tension between these two blocks. Uh, so because of this high tension, they behaved rather cautiously. But now with the end of Cold War, ironically, states now behave, in a sense, uh, perhaps more recklessly, or they make their claim more aggressive, if I may use this term, aggressive or assertive way. So that may be one reason. If you look at the behavior of some country in East Asia, East, East Asia with respect to these maritime claims, so you can certainly... Uh, notice uh, they behave much more assertive uh, way than before. And also, I think uh, rise of China is obviously a big uh, factor in this regard. Uh, China as a power uh, is increasing not only economically, but also politically, strategically, militarily. And uh, China has uh, uh, obviously reason to expand uh, its uh, uh, strategic boundary uh, more toward the uh, oceans, and they acquire, you know, naval capability. Recently, they launched uh, its first aircraft carrier. They are building some more aircraft carrier, and so on. So obviously, this has some impact uh, on the, this recent uh, surge of uh, um, maritime dispute in this part. And the second reason I can think of is uh, obviously this is a new. Uh, legal regime for ocean with the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. As I said, uh, in the past, uh, 
states was uh, entitled only to territorial sea up to three miles. But now state is uh, entitled to uh, not only territorial sea, but also 200 miles is at and the continental shelf and so on. So this uh, tiny island, the value of tiny island uh, compared to the past has increased dramatically. So states pay obviously has more uh, reason to uh, make claim to these uh, small islands. In the past, the value was not uh, was uh, rather marginal, uh, apart from this uh, symbolic value. But now, uh, really, uh, economic interest at stake is huge because of this uh, new uh, law of sea, new ocean regime. And the third, uh, maybe. Uh, may have something to do with uh, this uh, nationalistic sentiment, rise of nationalism in East Asia. This is a difficult subject, uh, but uh, uh, I think you can, you can see some surge of national se nationalistic sentiment uh, uh, here or there in East Asia. Uh, public is uh, usually very... I would say very sensitive to territorial issue, sovereignty issue in uh, in, in East Asia. So whenever uh, something happened uh, over those uh, small islands, uh, there is a huge surge of interest, uh, public interest, and then often government uh, uh, is uh, really influenced by this. Uh, is a nationalistic public and social network service uh, plays a kind of escalatory role in this regard. Uh, so you, you, you see this uh, uh, rise of uh, uh, nationalistic sentiments uh, uh, obviously has played some role in in escalating or exacerbating this, uh, this uh, maritime conflict in East Asia. Those are the reasons I can think of. There, maybe there are some more. But uh, as you said, uh, this dispute uh, uh, has been in Asia for several decades. You know, it's not a new dispute. It has been there. It doesn't come just out of blue last night. It has been there. But somehow, uh, during especially during Cold War period. Ironically, this dispute has been managed, you know. Uh, but uh, now, uh, uh, some more and more incidents uh, takes place. Uh, sometimes uh, you see escalation of tension over this uh, uh, dispute uh, to the very dangerous level. Uh, so I think those are the reasons why uh, we have a more um, uh, you know, tension over those issues these days. So, so basically there have been changes at the international uh, level. Uh, that will be sort of one systemic uh, explanation for, for the recent uh, intensification. You also have alluded to, to the economic dimension um, and the um, sort of... Uh, that various, um, for example, energy um, fields have been just discovered and there has been sort of rising interest, but also sort of domestic uh, dimensions and, and factors uh, play mm -hmm. into that, that as well. And, and maybe even sort of the uh, rise of the middle class and, and even social media, while they might play you know, a rather positive uh, role in the long term for, for democracy and peace in, in the region, in the uh, shorter term might actually complicate uh, uh, matters a, a bit. Um, have there been any sort of recent uh, initiatives by uh, national governments uh, or international organizations or for that matter non-governmental organizations uh, to mitigate these uh, conflicts uh, in East Asia? Um, there have been uh, substantial efforts uh, on the part of East Asian countries to manage or mitigate uh, these uh, disputes uh, over past uh, in fact, decades, uh, uh, countries in East Asia uh, were well aware of uh, importance of managing uh, maritime issues. Uh, 
or potential maritime conflicts. Uh, uh, so, for example, um, in ASEAN Regional Forum, ARF, uh, this is a, a, a political forum attended by Southeast Asian countries as well as Northeast Asian countries and some external powers such as United States. Uh, maritime uh, issue has been has always been on the agenda. It's one of the core agenda uh, of uh, Asian Regional Forum, uh, and also in sub sub regional levels, uh, countries have been uh, uh, have been uh, dealing with uh, certain maritime issues. Uh, uh, in a cooperative framework uh, and, and so on. So, um, and also uh, I must say this, uh, on uh, South China Sea, in fact, uh, there has been a lot of efforts uh, uh, by uh, ASEAN uh, countries and China to manage this dispute uh, so that uh, they cannot uh, get out of control over past uh, decades, uh, uh, but uh, obviously progress has not been uh, as uh, substantial as uh, many countries wished. Uh, uh, so there has been effort uh, and there has been some progress here and there, but uh, this dispute, uh, this core dispute uh, such as a territorial dispute or maritime boundary disputes, uh, of course, have not been resolved, uh, and in fact, over the past several e several years, uh, this has, in my view, this has uh, uh, this has aggravated, uh, this has deteriorated uh, over the past few years. And in fact, I have been following this uh, uh, this maritime conflicts or disputes in East Asia over, I think, more than twenty years, and I can uh, I can tell you that uh, on certain issues, uh, we have made uh, significant progress. For example, combating piracy in the Malacca Strait. Uh, but on the other hand, on the core issue like a territorial dispute or boundary dispute, the uh, situation has deteriorated. Right. Um, well, I mean, some, some scholars have suggested because it is uh, so difficult to really solve uh, and fundamentally solve uh, these uh, diverging territorial claims uh, and disputes about maritime boundaries, the way forward uh, is really to go for joint development uh, of uh, resources uh, in areas uh, concerned. How realistic do you think uh, such, such uh, suggestions are? Is this... Uh, just some sort of, you know, um, daydreaming of uh, scholars in, in ivory towers, or, or might there be sub substance to that? Well, I don't think it's daydreaming, um, but on the other hand, uh, you also have to be um, uh, realistic about what you uh, what you can expect. Uh, uh, I think joint development is, uh, in, in my view. Uh, one uh, is an important uh, alternative. Uh, and then there has been an uh, example of a successful uh, uh, joint development agreement uh, in East Asian region. In fact, uh, uh, country I came, I, I came from, Korea and Japan, uh, our neighbor uh, were able to... Uh, agree on joint development uh, in the continental shelf between two countries. In fact, in 1970s, two countries had serious dispute over uh, delimitation of boundary of continental shelf between two countries. In fact, they were really unable to resolve this issue. So what they did was they just put aside uh, this uh, difficult uh, boundary uh, delimitation and then they agreed to jointly develop this uh, this uh, zone, uh, which both countries uh, claimed. And, and that was uh, one of the first uh, joint development zone ever uh, um, agreed uh, uh, 
uh, not only in East Asia, but around the world. So we have this, uh, since then, of course, uh, we were, uh, both Korea and Japan were able to uh, uh, put aside uh, this, uh, this uh, delimitation issue, which divided two countries for a few years. Uh, so there, there is an example of uh, 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 successful um, uh, joint development, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, um, uh, you should uh, you shouldn't think that joint development is really a panacea for all this uh, maritime conflict because uh, it is very difficult to work out the joint development. So who is going to participate? Where this uh, uh, joint development uh, will take place? And uh, how to uh, how to you know uh, work out this uh, uh, profit uh, decision making uh, cost and this really uh, idea is great but uh, always the devils are in the details and uh, it's not that uh, easy to work out all these uh, details related to joint development but. Uh, I, I think joint development can be a good alternative to uh, constantly quarreling and, uh, uh, in, in fact, fighting over uh, this uh, this uh, uh, territory or island uh, or boundary. Mm. Right. Um, well, I mean, then looking beyond uh, joint development and uh, maybe towards uh, institution building, um, what would be your suggestions in, in that regard or what kind of initiatives uh, do you see there? I mean, can we at least uh, move towards some kind of uh, code of conduct, um, even maybe a legally uh, binding one, uh, that would sort of uh, then, then really sort of bind the, the actors uh, concerned uh, to playing along the rules, greed, whatever they might, might be. What, what do you see uh, how do you perceive the perspectives of uh, you know such uh, institution building? Well, institution building is necessary in in East Asia. Uh, of course, code of conduct uh, will be very helpful because uh, uh, one of the danger uh, related to maritime conflict in East Asia is. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the law enforcement or neighbor uh, 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 ships uh, operating in that area, sometimes they operate in a very uh, dangerous manner. So if you have a certain code of conduct about, uh, uh, say, maneuvering or operation of, uh, say, Coast Guard or na neighbor ships uh, in those sensitive areas, they can certainly help to prevent uh, any accidental um, uh, uh, clash uh, uh, between those countries. During Cold War period, the United States Navy and Soviet Navy used to uh, maneuver and operate in a very close uh, uh, distance, uh, in a very aggressive manner. And that was always a source of uh, big uh, uh, tension between two countries, and eventually United States and Soviet Union were able to agree on the incidence at sea agreement, uh, whereby they refrain from certain aggressive uh, maneuvering or operation in, 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 in the area where two navies uh, operate together. So that can be one example uh, that uh, East Asian country should consider. Um, obviously, in a contested area, in disputed area, uh, say, navy of uh, two countries uh, get too close to each other and then maneuver in an aggressive manner, you cannot rule out the possibility of uh, uh, accidental clash, which could escalate into major uh, major clash, major naval clash. Uh, so um, that's, that is one thing you should uh, consider. And always confidence building measures, uh, uh, transparency promoting measures will be helpful to reduce, uh, to reduce uh, tension. Um, 
In this regard, one thing I'd like to say is the uh, UN Convention on the Law of Sea, uh, this, uh, which I, I, I referred to many times already, is a really very good starting point for confidence building. If uh, state parties uh, really comply with uh, this convention, we can achieve uh, at least a certain level of confidence among countries. For example, UN Convention requires coastal states to be uh, to give certain publicity about uh, their maritime practice. Uh, uh, if if uh, you, you do this, and then you make very clear that uh, where is uh, your baseline, uh, where is uh, your territorial sea, and so on, then uh, you can avoid unnecessary tension. Uh, uh, South China Sea is case in point. Uh, we don't know really... Uh, position of uh, at least uh, some countries uh, with respect to South China Sea. Um, China has a very famous or, I don't know, notorious, depending on your perspective, uh, so-called uh, this uh, U, U-shaped line in South China Sea, nine dotted line. But uh, uh, few knows what this uh, U-shaped line means. Uh, uh, so um, there is a huge ambiguity, uncertainty over uh, this line. So uh, when you don't know what uh, this line means, uh, uh, it is very difficult uh, to to you know uh, avoid uh, any miscalculation or misperception and so on. So it is very important for state to be clear and transparent about the, their position. That is really starting point. This is, so this kind of code of conduct, uh, confidence building, risk reduction is uh, really necessary, needed uh, in, in East Asia. That should be a starting point. Do you think that such uh, confidence building measures in the uh, sort of military and non-military sense that they could really lead uh, to some sort of strategic trust uh, between the players involved, because I mean that seems to be the, the uh, basic issue or the basic problem uh, there that uh, that uh, trust, strategic trust uh, between the actors concerned is is, uh, is is missing. Well, um, I think strategic trust is a really big word. <laughs> I don't know how you can achieve this uh, strategic trust, uh, but. Uh, at least you can start with uh, easy things, small things, such as uh, uh, some, some at operational level, you can at least uh, uh, avoid uh, unnecessary uh, clash by refraining from certain conduct which could be easily misunderstood by the other party as an aggressive move and so on. So. Uh, such a kind of confidence building measure, risk reduction measure at operational level may not uh, lead eventually to uh, building of uh, strategic trust, but at least they can serve a certain purpose. Uh, then we can go uh, further step by step uh, uh, from small thing, easy thing to the mm -hmm. To the next and next. Right. Uh, so at least uh, such measures um, could could help to um, well contain a possible escalation uh, of, of of conflict. I, I think we we don't even yet have uh, military hotlines uh, in uh, East Asia uh, between a number of of the um, important uh, states there. Uh, of course, there there's also sort of an extra regional uh, player involved. Uh, and that is the United States. Um, how do you perceive the role of the United uh, States in all that? And, and, and what is the perspective uh, that, that the United States takes uh, on these uh, issues? It seems to me that uh, uh, the United States governments tend very much to emphasize freedom of navigation, uh, which um, is sort of more important than, than uh, maybe some codes of uh, conduct. So do you think that, that uh, the United States is, is really playing the sort of positive role in the region? Is it sort of uh, playing the role of a, of a stabilizer? Or is it actually contributing uh, to the conflicts uh, we have there? 
Sorry, that's a difficult one. A difficult one, uh, obviously. Um, but uh, pre freedom of navigation is not only for United States, but for everyone, for Germany, European Union countries, for Korea, everyone. Uh, this is really um, freedom applicable to every country, each and every country in the world. Um, I don't think uh, United States uh, takes any position with respect to territorial dispute. Uh, I don't think it's policy of United States or position of United States to take uh, uh, position with respect to territorial dispute. It uh, doesn't matter whether uh, party to territorial dispute is an ally of United States or opponent of United States. Anyway, the, the policy of United States is not to take any position on territorial dispute. On the other hand, as you mentioned, the United States uh, stress uh, freedom of navigation. Um, um, they also emphasize uh, states should comply with the UN Convention on the Law of Sea, while the United States itself is not a party to the UN Convention of the Law of Sea. In fact, the United States is uh, one of the few states which uh, is not a party to this convention. But anyway, it's good to hear that uh, United States saying that every country must comply with the United States, uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. I, I, I think the uh, United States, uh, well, uh, has played a constructive role in, in my view, in, in, in uh, maintaining um, uh, stability. Uh, in uh, in maritime uh, over maritime dispute in maritime conflict in East Asia, um, obviously the in, in my view the presence of U.S. Uh, in East Asia uh, uh, has been a constructive uh, force. Uh, obviously, plays certain role to. Uh, prevent uh, maritime conflict in East Asia from getting out of control. Um, well, it, it, like many things in life, it may have a uh, you know, positive or negative aspect, uh, but uh, overall, I think the U.S. has played a constructive role in maintaining uh, uh, stability uh, in, in, in East Asia. All right. So maybe one last question before we uh, move into the uh, Q&A uh, uh, session. Uh, what could or can be uh, the role of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in uh, dealing with these uh, conflicts in East Asia? What do you think? Well, um, maritime conflict in East Asia as you mentioned, it has a multiple dimension. It has territorial dispute, the boundary dispute, and many other uh, dispute over illegal fishing, piracy, marine environmental protection, and so on. Uh, obviously, I'm not naive to believe that uh, uh, law can resolve all these disputes. Uh, uh, however, I believe the law and uh, adjudication, adjudication means uh, the, what we do at the tribunal, you know, this uh, settling dispute by applying law, adjudication. So law and adjudication uh, can play an important role in, in promoting peace and stability in East Asia. Of course, we need a comprehensive approach to maritime conflicts in East Asia. We need, uh, as I mentioned, we need uh, uh, confidence building measures. We need, uh, uh, we need uh, transparency promoting actions by states in this part of the world. We need more cooperation like a joint development. Uh, but uh, uh, countries were unable to resolve their dispute uh, through negotiation or other means. Uh, uh, they can uh, submit their dispute to our tribunal or elsewhere for peaceful resolution. Um, as I 
mentioned in the beginning of uh, this talk, uh, I, I introduced to you this uh, case of uh, uh, boundary dispute between Bangladesh and Myanmar, which uh, was underway for more than 30 years, but we were able to resolve this dispute peacefully. Uh, so this can be done uh, uh, not only between these two countries, but between other countries. Uh, so uh, I hope, uh, uh, I, I, of course, I encourage countries to resolve their dispute uh, with other peaceful means. But if they are unable to do that, uh, then they should seriously consider uh, referring uh, their dispute to our tribunal here in Hamburg. Uh, they should visit Hamburg uh, uh, more often. Uh, uh, so I think uh, we have a role to play uh, in this regard. Uh, uh, we are ready to play such role. Uh, I can't say that we can resolve every dispute in East Asia. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we have a limited role to play and we are ready for that. Uh, it is up to uh, each state uh, to make use of uh, what is available to them. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we now have something like um, 25, 30 minutes or so for uh, Q&A, for questions. Um, would like to, to pose a question. All right. Okay. Why don't we start um, over there, the uh, gentleman on the left, the glasses. Yep. Question to the environment, to the maritime environment, uh, uh, especially uh, what do you think about nuclear uh, uh, waste in, in, in the uh, oceans? Or uh, does a company uh, that uh, puts uh, waste in the ocean has to uh, take it back? And the other question is uh, about environment, is about the whales. It's a long year discussion. <laughs> Well, uh, this uh, nuclear radioactive nuclear waste uh, at sea uh, now uh, dumping of uh, nuclear waste uh, is completely prohibited by London Convention. Uh, country used to dump low-level nuclear waste at sea in the past. Uh, but uh, by the middle of 1990s, uh, uh, dumping of uh, such waste as sea is completely uh, uh, prohibited. On the other hand, uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, it happens that uh, some country discharge. We use uh, we use term discharge. Yeah compared to dumping. Dumping is uh, ships uh, carrying nuclear waste that uh, goes to the sea and then they dump uh, this uh, waste at sea. But discharge is uh, uh, when, uh, say, nuclear facility is located at the uh, uh, coastal area. Sometimes this uh, cooling water can be discharged from this nuclear facility to sea. And then there is no clear um, regulation of discharge of a low level waste uh, uh, from nuclear facility on land, although there are some uh, as far as I know some regulation of uh, such discharge by IAEA International Atomic Energy Agency and so on uh, um, so because of this uh, kind of uh, loophole um, uh, in some cases this discharge of uh, nuclear waste uh, takes place uh, but uh, I think it should be uh, it should be uh, regulated in my view, and the whaling uh, this uh, now whaling dispute uh, is uh, before International Court of Justice, uh, which is different court uh, located in the Hague, uh, not before us. I wish it should have been brought to us <laughs> here in Hamburg, but it is now. Um, now, uh, now dealt with by International Court of Justice. I expect that the decision will come uh, uh, in the near future, uh, but I can't comment on the, <laughs> the substance of dispute over whaling. Uh, 
Right. <laughs> I think there was one gentleman further in the back on that side. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. First of all, gentlemen, I want to thank you for the interesting discussion. But um, nevertheless, I got a question concerning the subject of artif um, no, islands and rocks you were talking about and how they could even extend the maritime boundaries or even state territory. Um, the question crossed my mind, if states actually can extend their maritime boundaries or even the state territory by building artificial islands. And I'm not talking about um, offshore platforms, but artificial islands they build with maybe natural resources they take from their own territory. Well, thank you for the question. Artificial island is not entitled to uh, even territorial sea, let alone exclusive economic zone and uh, uh, continental shelf. Uh, uh, states can uh, uh, state can uh, establish so-called safety zone around artificial island, but artificial island is not entitled to any maritime zones. Uh, so you build artificial island uh, uh, and uh, try to uh, claim a huge maritime zone surrounding artificial island that is not allowed under international law and law of sea convention. Right. Um, ich hätte vielleicht auch sagen sollen, dass natürlich Fragen auf Deutsch gestellt äh, werden können. Also insofern, ähm, bitte tun Sie sich da keinen Zwang an. Wir machen hier drüben weiter hinten. Ich habe, ich habe die Frage, welche Möglichkeiten haben Länder ohne eigene Küste, also Binnenländer, bei der Nutzung, wirtschaftlichen Nutzung der Meere? Um, of course, uh, landlocked states uh, uh, ha have a certain right uh, to, to uh, use of ocean. Uh, if you look at the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, landlocked country or geographically disadvantaged country uh, have a right to access to the sea. Uh, and also, um, uh, there are certain uh, s certain rights uh, recognized by the convention. For example, um, when coastal states uh, give access to so-called the surplus uh, fishes uh, in their economic zone, they should uh, uh, take into account uh, this uh, landlock or geographically disadvantaged country in, in distributing this uh, surplus catch. So, uh, um, you know, uh, this new legal regime for ocean, uh, uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, allow coastal states to expand their uh, maritime zone immensely. They used to claim only territorial sea up to three miles, but now they are allowed to claim territorial sea up to 12 miles. They can claim EEZ up to 200 miles. They can claim continental shelf, which, which can extend up to 350 miles or even more. So uh, this means that uh, so-called high sea where freedom of, uh, is, freedom of sea is applied was uh, shrunken considerably Uh, that means uh, really a um, um, uh, huge disadvantage for uh, such geographically disadvantaged states or landlocked states. Uh, so in return for uh, allowing coastal states to extend uh, their maritime zone, uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea gave certain rights uh, to the uh, landlocked states and uh, geographically disadvantaged states. One of those rights... Uh, recognized by the convention is a right to access to sea. Uh, of course, uh, that's what the convention said, but in practice, uh, I know that there are several disputes over this uh, right of access. Uh, uh, for example, um, country like uh, 
in my region, countries like uh, Nepal or Bhutan, which, is, which are landlocked states next to India, uh, they have a dispute with India over access to sea. Uh, convention require neighboring states to give access to those landlocked states, but sometimes uh, uh, this negotiation is not easy. Um, also, currently, there is a dispute before International Court of Justice uh, between uh, Chile and Bolivia. Uh, that's not a really dispute under UN Convention on the Law of Sea, but again, this is also a dispute over access to uh, sea. You know, Bolivia is a landlocked state. Uh, uh, they want to have uh, access to Pacific uh, Ocean. Uh, they were, you know, uh, locked uh, uh, by um, uh, Chile and Peru, so they, they have dispute. Uh, this Bolivia has dispute uh, with Chile. But anyway, this uh, uh, right of access uh, of uh, landlocked states is one of the uh, one of the also uh, issues uh, under uh, law of the sea. Ja, ich glaube, hier auf dieser Seite waren noch ein paar äh, Fragen. Vielleicht zu jetzt. Ja, vielleicht machen wir mit der Dame dort erstmal weiter. Ja? Ich vergesse nicht, keine Angst. Um, good evening. What kind of role do you think does communication intelligence play in this whole conflict situation as well as in regards to border control and also um, military sector? I'm sorry, what was the, your first... The communication intelligence. What do you think, uh, what role does communication intelligence play in this uh, conflict, in the maritime conflicts as well in regards to border control and military? Um, communication intelligence. Communication intelligence. Um, Is that constant thought? Is, would it be possible to? <laughs> that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but. <laughs> Fernmeldeaufklärung. Well, that, that's, a, that's a hard one for translators. I think it's too hard to explain. If you if you don't know, probably <laughs> the guys from the Bundeswehr can explain it a little bit better. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. But Is that an uh, out-of-area mission? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, then, okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem, thank you. Right. Yeah, the, the, the Herr here in the ersten Reihe. Thank you. Uh, Klaus Vlada, uh, Professor Pike. Um, to my, what extent does it matter whether a potentially habitable island, a habitable island is actually hab habited or not habited? And what does uh, the nationality of the habitants play in who belongs uh, the island to? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in, in, in habitable or uninhabitable island, uh, well, it's obviously very difficult to uh, tell what is an uh, inhabitable island and what is an uh, uninhabitable island. Uh, uh, but I can guess that, uh, uh, by the way, in the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, there is no uh, clear criteria in determining uh, uh, whether island is inhabitable or not. Uh, but I can uh, imagine uh, that uh, uh, whether this island has uh, drinkable water, uh, you can't live uh, without water, or whether this island uh, has, uh, say, vegetation, um, and, and, and so on. But, of course, uh, these days, uh, you can always uh, bring in the, this supply. Uh, <laughs> you can bring in tons of waters, and you can, you can inhabit there. So, uh, in fact, there is no place in the world which uh, cannot be uh, 
inhabitable in, in, indeed. Uh, uh, but uh, um, obviously, uh, international law of sea says uh, rocks which cannot sustain human habitation. When you say which cannot sustain human habitation, maybe this place in natural condition without the supply from outside uh, can sustain such habitation or not. That may be the key criteria in my view. So maybe whether it has uh, water, it has vegetation. Uh, Ah, um, well, if uh, people live there, uh, maybe uh, it can be argued as evidence that this island is uh, habitable. Uh, then um, nationality of people who, who, who live there uh, maybe can be also another factor uh, to be considered in determining whether this island belongs to the country uh, uh, you know, uh, where this, uh, this, uh, this inhabitants of this island uh, comes from. So they can be a one factor. You can argue that, uh, look, uh, uh, Germans uh, have lived there for, uh, for, for many years, uh, so that island may belong to us. Uh. <laughs> Malvina. Well, it's one factor to be considered, right? <laughs> Among many others. I guess could, maybe I think we, because we don't have that much time left, just some 10 minutes, maybe we can sort of move on. Um, yeah, they had a um, roten pullover. Ich wollte gerne wissen, wer vor dem Seegerichtshof uh, klagen kann. Yes. Well, uh, in our tribunal, it is, uh, in most cases, states. States file suit uh, to the tribunal. I didn't get translation. I didn't get interpreted. Can you? Can you? Well, each EU, yes, EU is also party to UN Convention on the Law of Sea. In fact, EU once uh, appeared before our tribunal in a, in a dispute with Chile before. So EU can uh, appear uh, before our tribunal for no, official... No, I'm talking about uh, Somalia being the claimant and Somalia coming and saying the EU... Uh, the EU is violating our national rights of fisheries in front of our coastline. Well, I, I think Somalia can do that against EU if that is the case. Well, and what happened? These Somalians turned up as pirates in front of a national court in Germany. How do you explain that? Well, <laughs> well I, I don't know what is the relation between Somalia uh, starting. <laughs> starting legal action against the EU and uh, this piracy. But, uh, but the, in fact, when there was uh, this uh, big uh, media attention to piracy, uh, some people... Uh, suggest that the uh, International Tribunal for the Law of Sea may, uh, may try these uh, pirates. Uh, uh, but uh, we are not a criminal court. Uh, we don't deal with, uh, uh, we, we mainly deal with interstate dispute. We don't, we don't uh, prosecute or punish pirates. Uh, so don't worry, pirates will not come here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they might already be here. Um, anyhow, um, wir haben, glaube ich, noch mehrere Personen hier. Bitte. Ja. 
may you have a scale which of these uh, conflicts in Asia could run into a war medium long term? Just the potential. Is it one of them? Is there a danger that the uh, war could run? In, in East future? Asia? In East Asia. In Asia, yes. Hmm. Um, well, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> definitely, I hope not. Uh, uh, well, I can't say definitively that uh, this may not uh, escalate into major war in East Asia, but uh, I think it is not very likely that uh, this uh, maritime conflict uh, can develop into uh, major conflict or major war in East Asia, given the, the fact that uh, uh, um, obviously, no country in the East Asian region uh, want uh, uh, such uh, su such situations, and there is also um, uh, we have a kind of strategic this uh, um, system or constraint over escalation of this kind of dispute into major war in East Asia. Uh, you can't. Be hundred percent sure, but uh, I believe it's not very likely that uh, uh, this will develop into major uh, major war in East Asia. Ja, ich glaube, ich hatte noch eine Frage dort äh, hinten und äh, wir, ich würde ganz gerne in der Reihenfolge zunächst äh, verfahren. Yeah, thank ja, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, one question in regard to the South China Sea conflict. Um, where we have many countries with historical claims. I would be interested in um, other de decisions of the International Court of the Law of the Seas. Um, how did you handle these historical claims and how important we are there? Because I know that in the South China Sea, many are highly disputed. Hmm. Well, um, here I don't really want to get into this uh, this substance, uh, I know um, one country to this dispute uh, makes such uh, uh, claim or argument uh, uh, based on historic title and so on. But I can't say, you know, uh, what I think about such such claim. Uh, um, but I can say this, uh, we are a law of seat tribunal. Uh, we don't uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, territorial dispute uh, itself. Uh, uh, maybe territorial dispute uh, connected with uh, maritime dispute, uh, ocean dispute, uh, can be submitted to us if parties agree to submit this dispute to us. But we, we, I don't believe we can deal with just territorial sea uh, itself uh, without being connected to maritime dispute. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm sorry, but I can't uh, comment on the, this, uh, uh, say, substance of this, uh, this position. Right, I think we still have time for one, at the most, two rather concise and brief questions. Die Greenpeace-Leute sind doch äh, nach Russland verhaftet worden. Und da, da müsste man doch eigentlich auch den Seegerichtshof anrufen können. Denn die haben doch nur demonstrieren wollen und wollten nicht Piraten sein, sondern nur etwas anbringen, soweit ich das in der Presse gehört habe. Kann da der Seegerichtshof etwas tun für die Leute, die da jetzt verurteilt werden sollen? Hm? Well. Um, das ist eine Frage der Zuständigkeit des uh, Gerichtshofs. Well, well, this is a public information. Um, um, Dutch government, uh, in fact, uh, this Greenpeace ship is registered in Netherlands. So Dutch government uh, last Friday uh, started uh, legal action against uh, Russian Federation. And uh, uh, what the Dutch government said uh, uh, was uh, if uh, uh, 
two countries, uh, Netherlands and Russia, are unable to reach a solution by um, um, by two weeks time. In two weeks time, which is uh, 18th of October, uh, they will uh, submit the urgent uh, request for release of vessel and crew to to here Hamburg, uh, our tribunal in Hamburg. Uh, so we will see what will happen. Uh, um, you may see some Greenpeace activists here in Hamburg. Uh, I, I don't know, but that's the public information uh, available. You can see on on BBC or Reuters. Uh, you know, so that's that's the situation. Right. I guess that uh, brings us uh, to the end of today's uh, discussion. Unless there are some uh, sort of announcements uh, from the uh, Kerber Foundation, maybe concerning the next uh, maybe, yes. uh, seminar. Yeah. But first, we have to give the applause to you. Please listen. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you very much for your very interesting discussion and the information on Ihnen, meine Damen und Herren. Ebenso ein herzliches Dankeschön für die aktive Diskussion. Ich für mich habe heute Abend etwas äh, in unserem Thema Neuer Ost, Neue Mächte wieder Neues gelernt. Und das war eine eher, wie soll ich das sagen, akademische Variante der Diskussion über die Situation in Asien. Und ich fand es sehr spannend, hier einmal eine ganz andere Variante und ohne die ja doch oft in unseren Diskussionen vorherrschende Frage nach Macht, nach Schuld, welche Länder haben welche Interessen. Natürlich interessiert uns auch das. Und insofern darf ich Sie vielleicht schon hinweisen auf unsere nächste Debatte, die wir in diesem Kontext führen werden. Wir freuen uns darauf, Sie Ende November wieder im Rahmen dieses Schwerpunktes hier begrüßen zu dürfen, wenn wir die Reihe zu den Demokratien in Asien mit einer Veranstaltung zum Thema Japan unter Abe, Reform oder Rückschritt mit Professor Jung Io und Frau Professor Gabriele Fuch, die wir auch heute Abend hier unter uns wissen, fortsetzen werden. Seien Sie uns zu diesem Termin wiederum herzlich willkommen. Aber bevor ich Sie verabschiede, lade ich Sie selbstverständlich, wie bei uns üblich, jetzt gerne ein zu einem Glas Wein, um das Gehörte zu vertiefen, zu diskutieren oder auch insgesamt über dieses Thema zu sprechen. Herzlichen Dank, dass Sie bei uns waren. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause, aber freuen wir uns jetzt auf einen Schluck zusammen. Danke. Applaus